So welcome everyone. It's my great pleasure to open today's seminar for teaching business human rights, um, focused on fishing and forced labor. I'm Dorothy Bauman Polly. Many of you know me. I direct the Geneva Center for Business Human Rights, and my role today is merely to introduce the speakers and true drivers of this teaching tool. Um, at the Geneva Center for Business Human Rights, a part of our mission is to help integrate human rights in business school education. And um, the access to teaching tools is key for facilitating the uptake of human rights in business schools. There are not enough teaching tools available. And I'm thrilled that we um, partnered with the ILO and pooled our expertise um, on forced labor and fishing. This is the first of what hopefully become a series of teaching tools that we are creating together. So now let me get to um, today's um, speakers who will guide you through um, the session today. Um, the objective of the session is for you to really familiarize yourself with, with what we've created and how we've already used it in some of our classes. And there will be plenty of time in the end for you to ask questions um, to anyone who's used it before, et cetera. So, um, let me first introduce you to my colleague, um, Berit Knack, um, at the Center um, in Geneva. Berit and I co-taught a session last um, semester um, using the teaching resources. I think we were the first ones um, testing them, and uh, that went very well because we had help from Alex, uh, Alex Nasri from the ILO. She is based in Geneva and she is the expert on forced labor and ran a big project on fishing. She will talk more about that in a minute. And she came to class as a guest um, and um, supported this first round of teaching. Also, my dear colleague, Charles Otima, who is a lecturer at HEC um, Paris, but also runs our um, research cluster on supply chains. Um, Charles also supported that very first time we tested the teaching resources and he taught it himself at HSC Paris. So he also comes with um, experience and he was the one who drafted the background um, uh, document, which is essentially the, which are essentially the teaching notes. Um, as always, I also wanna thank the team of GBSN, Julie, Juliana and Dan is here too help us to set up these seminars. And the seminar will be recorded um, so that um, if you know of an instructor who might be interested in using the tools at a later point of time, there is accompanying material um, where we talk you through what we've created. Um, and when I say what we've created, this really includes more people than the ones I've just introduced. Um, it does include um, at least another handful of experts that we had invited to a teaching workshop um, in Geneva. And it was a true process of co-creation. So pooling the resources um, from the ILO and from academia um, resulted in those teaching materials now. The context is something that I want Alex to better explain because the resources were created as part of an MOU, a, a Memorandum of Understanding that we signed with the ILO um, over a year ago now, where we committed to joining forces to create such teaching resources. And I want to hand over to Alex to have her talk more about what motivated the ILO to reach out to us um, as a group of academics committed to bringing human rights to business school education. So Alex, thank you, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dorothy. And uh, it's a big pleasure to be with all of you today um, to discuss such an important uh, topic and partnership, a new type of partnership uh, for the ILO. Uh, for those of you who are not fully familiar with the ILO, uh, so we are a United Nations agency that promotes social justice and the protection of labor rights. And um, in the UN world, we are a bit different because we are what we call tripartite, which means that uh, our members are not only governments, but also workers' organizations and employers' organizations. So we interact a lot in the adoption of our labor standards and in our day-to-day -day work in the field with employers um, uh, in different countries. And um, 
more and more we were seeing um, over the past 10 years some um, requests coming from the private sector on the fact that often uh, new professionals are not fully equipped with uh, the tools um, and um, um, I mean the knowledge that they need to actually address challenges around labor rights, labor rights violation and human rights more generally. Uh, and we also saw in some countries that it, it we, we really needed to do much more with this new generation of future business leaders um, that were hired by those companies that had more and more um, demands coming from different legislations and other soft law on making sure that they respect uh, human rights and labor rights in their supply chains. Uh, so for the ILO, I think this was quite a natural uh, partnership uh, to um, approach uh, the University of Geneva Cent uh, Center for Business and Human Rights and uh, the Global Business School Network um, to actually partner together so that we could think of how to develop resources uh, for academia, for business schools around the world uh, that can be helpful in teaching this new generation of, of business leaders the right skills that they will need uh, in terms of, uh, of protection of workers' rights uh, uh, generally. Um, and so I think today is dedicated to show you what we have started to develop, uh, why we have started by those important topics, because it's true that in the field of labor rights, it's quite a, a, a wide uh, array, um, uh, but uh, there are also some, some priorities for businesses um, among those aspects. So, um, yeah, it's a big pleasure to be here after... All, a bit more than one year of signing this memorandum of understanding. Uh, thank you for the invitation, and I hope that um, today we can we can show you much more concretely what this partnership uh, has already delivered and how it can be helpful um, in in your teaching. Thank you, Dorothy. Over to you, Shao. <laughs> I think. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. And Alex, I'll come back to you just after maybe for you to tell us uh, maybe more precisely why why forced labor and maybe why the fishing industry. But just before that, um, I'm going to maybe show everyone a little bit what these teaching resources, as we call them, look like. It's um, quite difficult, uh, the task that we, we had to try to design something standard uh, but also relevant to a global audience. Um, if we look at, at GBSN members, you have, uh, I think, nearly 150 members currently uh, from over 50 countries. Uh, some of them are located uh, with uh, on the ocean, maybe have uh, a fishing industry of their own. Some of them might be uh, markets for fish. Um, some of them might not be directly related, but might have um, uh, consumer goods that are made uh, with fish or have fish in their supply chain or have food and beverage uh, in the hospitality sector that use fish. So there's a lot of different entry points. And the challenge for us is to make sure that uh, someone that is teaching management um, in, in Nigeria or um, in Singapore or uh, in Argentina, uh, we will find in this in, in this resource something that is useful and will understand how uh, he or she can can make this relevant for his students. Um, so it uh, predominantly looks like a like a web page, um, which is convenient because it's something we can we can change uh, regularly. We can update it. We can um, play around a little bit with the content if we think that there's anything important that needs to be displayed. Uh, it's hosted uh, by the GBSN website. So obviously it falls within this MOU that uh, Alix and, and Doro were talking about. Um, we've put some contacts uh, to make sure that if people actually want to interact with the resource, they can send us emails and, um, and we can make sure that we can address any questions people have. Um, 
we talk a little bit about the why, but I think uh, Alex will elaborate on that just a, a bit later. Um, it's open source. Obviously, the idea is that it's it's free to use. Um, it's it's uh, a starting point. It's also free to um, adjust, adapt, contextualize as as teachers might want. Um, we've designed it in a way that um, it could it doesn't require any any um, initial knowledge. Um, so if teachers want to give it to undergraduates which are completely unfamiliar with the industry it's possible to do it mm -hmm. uh, but also we've tried to make sure that if um, it's done in a, in a framework where uh, uh, participants have already have some knowledge about the industry or might be working in the industry there's also um, some mm -hmm. more in-depth um, type of learning that can that can be done and as I said it's 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 meant to be a living document for those of you who are not following what's happening in um, commercial fishing. Um, it's quite a dynamic sector with a lot of um, debates going on, especially related to uh, human rights and labor rights. And so it can very well be that in the next couple of months, next couple of years, there are some important decisions, policy, whatever you want that might appear. And it would be important for us to be able to reflect that in the tool. Um, it starts off with some learning objectives, quite general. Um, it's uh, like any type of teaching in this field, which is at the crossroads between uh, human rights, uh, uh, education, labor rights education, uh, uh, but also business management education. Uh, we want to achieve several things. First, we want to inform students about a specific industry um, and understand how uh, you know, going in depth into an industry can help them uh, identify challenges. Uh, then we want to look at specific type of human rights challenges and how businesses can be uh, related and act on these challenges. And the last learning objective is really about a solutions oriented kind of uh, education where irrespective of uh, the position students might have, they understand how they can um, take decisions that will improve the situation. Obviously, what we're trying to achieve as an end goal is that uh, the beneficiaries of this teaching, uh, when they are in a position in, in the business sector uh, or in other types of sectors, in policy, in society organizations, can act upon what is currently happening. Um, in, in designing the learning objectives, we've tried also to make sure that um, uh, we uh, differentiate a little bit what um, the uh, tentative audiences might be expecting. Um, I've been teaching this course, for example, mostly for undergraduate, bachelor students. So you're uh, basically talking with uh, individuals that don't have um, so much business experience. And so you're trying to help them um, imagine what it could look like, how they could uh, act upon. Uh, but you could imagine that uh, this teaching could go all the way to executive education. And um, in this case, you would want to run the sessions really differently um, because you would be uh, in the room with people who already uh, might have some ideas of what they can do or might be expecting much more targeted approaches to specific positions. Um, and, um, and so we're trying to address that. Uh, as uh, Barrett was saying, there's kind of two standard tools to help a teacher uh, uh, feel comfortable going into the classroom and talking with his students about fish. One is um, a slide deck. That's what uh, probably most of uh, us actually use in the classroom, you know, as support document, something we can send the students afterwards if they want to review it. So there's a, a standard slide deck and some some standard teaching notes that I'll talk about uh, later. Um, on top of that, uh, we've created two sections. One is a section with background material, um, meant, I would say, both for educators and students. So this is easily something that a teacher can send to students ahead of the class, just so that uh, his students are already a little bit informed about what the conversation is going to be about. But it's also meant to be something that uh, teachers can 
look at to uh, increase a little bit their understanding uh, of the issue. So it's mostly videos, um, and newspaper articles, there's a podcast in there as well, and they um, go in a lot of different um, regions. You have Africa, Asia, um, uh, Latin America. America. Um, you, also, you also have some, some videos from the ILO about concrete technical assistance projects, what's being done on the ground with different stakeholders on this, on this topic. And then the final element is um, uh, some teaching experiences and even um, uh, some recordings from actual teaching. Uh, so that's uh, that's something that's useful. Uh, um, you have some teaching slides that are not the standard ones, but kind of have been adapted to other types of audiences or in other countries. And you have um, yeah recordings of guest lectures, which can also um, give educators uh, an idea of how what it looks like and and things like this. So that's um, that's the teaching resource as we call it. Uh, and before I talk to you a little bit about the teaching notes, show you what's in there. Uh, Maybe I can ask Alix to tell us a bit more about, you know, why these issues of um, forced labor, um, uh, the fishing industry are so critical uh, today. Over to you, Alix. Thank you, Charles. So um, why, why we decided to develop the first of our um, joint teaching resources on forced labor so um, for in terms of forced labor, uh, this is what we call at the ILO a fundamental labor right. Uh, in fact, we have uh, only a few fundamental labor rights, which are, if you want, what are the human rights of the labor rights? What are those labor rights that, that really are extremely important to, to protect? Uh, among those, you have um, the, I mean, being free from forced labor, being free from child labor, um, the importance of uh, freedom of association and collective bargaining, the importance of being non-discrimination, not discriminated at work, and also uh, um, to work in a healthy working environment. So we decided to zoom in on forced labor uh, because it's a fundamental right. And uh, because it's a fundamental right, it's also a key um reputational risk for businesses if there are violations of forced labor. Um, and uh, forced labor, it's particularly difficult to detect, uh, even compared to other labor rights violation. And, and it, it takes uh, a good understanding of how it can appear in different segments of the supply chain, how it can be detected, and then what are some of the solutions. Um, what we have also seen is that uh, businesses themselves have come to us, to the ILO, to uh, mention that more and more in the past 10 years, there has been the development of uh, mandatory due diligence legislation uh, on forced labor or transparency type of legislation on forced labor, which has have pushed, in fact, companies to um, have to understand better where are the risk of forced labor and to address them. Um, then we wanted also uh, to zoom in, uh, to take an example of a sector um, uh, that is at risk, at higher risk of forced labor, so that we can dive in more on the practicalities of how do we actually eradicate forced labor in one at risk sector. And that's why we selected fishing. Uh, why fishing in particular? I mean, this is um, a sector where the risk of forced labor is, is, um, is higher uh, than other sectors. We estimate that at the minimum, there is 128,000 fishers that are in forced labor. This is probably a big underestimation. Um, and this is also a sector which is very complex, very complex for company because it's transnational by nature. Uh, and so the legal responsibility to protect the rights the, you know, of fishers on board fishing vessels is quite a complex matter. Um, so, so we wanted to also uh, showcase in the tool, how do you address those sectors that are very transnational with different type of responsibilities from flag states, from port states, from market states that are buying the seafood? And how do you actually, uh, how, how can you 
um, uh, you know, resolve some of those um, uh, issues. And lastly, um, the ILO, uh, since uh, three years, have really tried to accelerate uh, its different programs uh, in the field in different countries to eradicate forced labor in fishing. So we've been working a lot with employers, with trade unions, with governments, and especially labor inspectors that actually inspect vessels on, their, on labor conditions. So we have learned a lot. And we wanted to share all of this data also on you know, solutions that are being developed by different countries in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America. Uh, and that can be very, very helpful um, uh, for students. Um, and lastly, we selected also fishing because it has links with many other sectors. I mean, obviously with services and hospitality, with agro-business, retail, um, so uh, it, in fact, impacts uh, many, many different industries. Uh, and so it is relevant for really every region of the world and uh, many different companies. So um, I think that was also one of our main objectives um, with this teaching, uh, teaching tool. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Alex. And so, I mean, before we talk just a little bit about some teaching experiences, I can um, show you what the uh, the main teaching notes look like um, to give you an idea of really what is the content that's available for teachers who want to uh, um, uh, to deliver this in there in the classroom. So, just going back quickly on the the website I showed you earlier, um, if I go into the teaching notes here. Um, so it's dated from uh, December 2022. This is actually when the um, the workshop that was done to develop this tool uh, was was organized. Um, and so it's the starting point of this whole work. There's a little bit of background, but I'll spare you that. Um, some of the elements I, I told you that are also featured on the website about the fact that there's no prerequisite, the learning objectives, et cetera, but going really into the content, so it's about it. It's a 25 page document. Um, um, also related to the fact that th the way we've conceived it is we don't know exactly who teaches what and how much time is available uh, for any given teacher. Um, I sometimes have, um, you know, a very hands on activity with students, a little group of 10 students for a full day. And sometimes I only have a one hour um, a master class with 70 students. So obviously, depending on the format, um, it can really vary what you will what you will do, whether it will be participatory or just kind of a top down lecture. What we've agreed upon in terms of the um, the standard format that we're considering is is a two to three hour lecture for a group of, let's say, um, 30 to 35 students, um, which seems like a little bit um, um, a standard uh, a standard class, and that's how it's framed. Uh, but obviously, uh, for example, the time that is indicated, all of that is really just um, um, theoretical and can be completely adapted. Um, it's, it's based in kind of units, which all correspond to the learning objectives. Um, and it's also looking at maybe uh, what can happen before uh, uh, the class actually happen and then what happens in the classroom. So this is why there's a, a unit zero, which is supposed to be before the class, uh, and then what really happens uh, during, the, during the class. Um, so yeah, some context that can be sent, a timeline, a lot of resources, as you can see, it's interactive. Um, uh, Fishing can be a bit technical for who's not used to this industry. Uh, so, you know, there are some concepts like uh, uh, abandonment or um, flag states or beneficial ownership that uh, Ali is talking about. So what we've done is we've included a glossary within the tool uh, and all words that are in blue and, and, and bold are actually defined at the end of the tool for anyone who would want to make sure they, they get the, the concepts clear. What is fish meal? I mean, for a uh, fish specialist, this is quite evident, but not for anyone who's not into this field. Um, 
Now and then uh, in the notes, we actually give some tips for contextualization. This is really the, the, the main part where we think teachers can really uh, adjust the tool to make it really relevant to, to their audience. And at the end of each unit, uh, we suggest uh, activities. So as I was saying, this is unit zero, it's pre-class. So we suggest, for example, sending a uh, a survey to students, some questions that can be sent out. That's just a template. Uh, teachers can copy paste that into Moodle or, or Blackboard and send it out to the students or do it differently if they want. But it's just like some, some suggestions. Um, and then you go down here and, you know, basically it goes back to what Alix was saying. Why is the fishing industry a relevant one? What's kind of the trends, the economic trends in this industry? How is this uh, industry evolving? Here you have the uh, indicative time based on a three hour um, uh, lecture. You would want to um, dedicate between half an hour to one hour to making sure students understand what the industry looks like. And again, all of these concepts that are defined and tips for contextualization here and there. So uh, sometimes we uh, put some focus on, <laughs> on some um, Issues that we think are, are critical, in this case, beneficial ownership can be quite tricky. Um, and here again, at the end of each unit, um, some activities um, that can happen and also some suggestions for what we call deep dives. So teachers might want to, to look at this. It's how you can connect uh, teaching forced labor and fishing with other types of issues. Um, afterwards, unit two is, is um, well, specific to, uh, to more forced labor. Um, uh, the indicators, obviously, some of the key issues, raising the topic of migrant workers as well. Um, and um, yeah, the legal framework, the relevant conventions, et cetera, et cetera. And again, um, resources for that unit and activities that teachers can do. Um, the same thing for the last unit about management solutions um, and, um, and um, yeah, basically still tips for contextualization, context boxes, and um, ideas of activities at the end. Um, the glossary I was talking about is, is featured towards the end uh, with all the key concepts. What's a coastal state? Well, what is debt bondage in the context of forced labor? Uh, what's an exclusive uh, economic zone in the context of fishing, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the end, you have a little bit of a, a profile of who are the co-authors of, um, of this tool. Um, and yeah, that's it. Uh, so quite a rich tool. It does take time to go through it, uh, but normally it has all of the fundamental information that someone would would need. Um, obviously, if you go look at the links, you can lose yourself in hundreds of hours of content. Uh, but the 25-page uh, document is really what someone should know to be able to teach this. Um, talking about teaching, we've done some experiments. Uh, maybe, Barrett, you want to, to share some experiences that uh, you've had or that uh, you've gathered of teachers teaching this um, this. Sure, thank you. Now, I think you've all already got a very good impression of the material that's out there. That's uh, kind of the foundation based on which you can integrate this topic into your own courses. The second part of the core documents that's online are the lecture slides. For technical reasons, they are online as a PDF format, but you can just send us an email and then we will share the open source uh, PowerPoint slides with you. The email address is also on the website again. So uh, the standard slides that are on there are based on a course, as uh, Charles described, master level, three hours, um, about 20 to 30 students. Um, so that particular slide deck we used uh, for the pilot test in Doris class, which uh, we taught at the University of Geneva. It's a master level course, uh, takes three hours. And uh, this session took place about in the middle of uh, of the course. So the students had some prior knowledge of what are human rights, what does uh, human rights due diligence look like in uh, global supply chains. Um, for this specific class, we had uh, Alix and her colleague Alison as guest speakers. 
and uh, Charles also um, join us virtually for a part. Um, so that's totally an option that you reach out to some of the experts for each of the teaching resources um, or use the videos from teaching that is online. There have also been a couple of other um, uses of these materials already, most of them in dedicated business and human rights, social sustainability classes, business ethics, so uh, from teachers who have some prior knowledge in this area. It's not required, but it makes it easier. Um, also, for, uh, for the courses that have been taught so far, um, using these resources, there have been master level courses and bachelor level courses. And the feedback we, we received is, first of all, there's a great demand for cases that actually illustrate human rights in practice. And partnering with the ILO has um, given us an exceptional amount of uh, on the ground knowledge, what that looks like in practice. Um, so in terms of the feedback we received, there are three main um, elements that are contextualized for the teaching. One obviously are the course parameters. So how many, um, how long is the course? We taught it for three hours, but some already taught it for one and a half hours only, and then shorten it accordingly. Um, and also the number of students will allow more or less interaction. So some of the activities have to um, be cut short, for example. Um, then also the adaptation to context is crucial. So some students may have some prior knowledge, as I just indicated for Dora's class. Um, others have no background at all. Um, so that's uh, another option that you can use, where you can use the background material to give a head start for the students when you meet them in class. Um, and one, and also the, the prior knowledge differs very much according to the country where it is taught. So the teaching resource has already been used in the context in Indonesia, where the fishing industry is much more visible um, in terms of, because it's a bigger part of the economy and of the uh, labor market. Um, and also in terms of the level. So some of the um, lecturers who've taught the, um, the fishing material in a bachelor class um, got questions from students who had seen Netflix documentaries or conspiracy uh, videos and just came up with these with these questions and uh, bits and pieces of knowledge. So that's something to to adapt to. And uh, then the teaching resources are set up in a way that you can use them, but they are modular. So there are standalone units that can be combined. And one feedback that we received so far is that these building blocks could also be even smaller portions that we have a dedicated video on the definition of forced labor, for example, um, or smaller bits and pieces to combine and, and shift around with. And that's something we take uh, um, as feedback and will integrate over time on the website too. So those are the experience that we've uh, had so far. Berit, thank you. May, may I just add two little things um, because that we were teaching this class together. Um, first of all, of course, we're very lucky that we're based in Geneva and this is also where Alex and Alison were based and they could easily <laughs> come over um, to our classroom and um, teach certain sections of this module. Um, but we recorded their contributions. So the videos on the website, if Alex is not available live <laughs> or Alison, you can actually plug them in through the videos where they speak um, with authority about forced labor. Um, so uh, yes. that I think is a huge um, advantage that we have built up a little library of video clips. And as you mentioned, um, more might be useful um, as you are starting to teach this, you know, please consider, are you doing something that could be helpful for others as well? Then record it, send it to us and we can put it on the website. As Charles pointed out, this is supposed to be a living document and a website that grows organically as more um, instructors use those resources. Um, I would love to integrate your slide decks, your videos, um, so that we build up a little library of options um, for how to teach the subject. That yeah, the and also that. different hooks maybe yeah. to contextualize it. We made suggestions. Um, so we, I don't know, in the beginning, we we uh, started with a connection to cats and cat food, fish and cat food, but uh, others um, might have might use different hooks. So for example, for the hospitality sector, it could be uh, linked to procurement 
or for consumer goods to cosmetics, or it could even be for marketing used to certifications and labels. So there are different um, starting points to then integrate forced labor into the teaching, because that's the, the main idea, to use human rights topics, integrate them in management education, and then find a context um, that works as an illustration, in this case, the fishing industry. I can give a little bit of, of feedback also on the experiences teaching this class. Um, uh, so I've taught it already uh, three times and will be teaching it in just a couple of weeks again in my new business and human rights class. Um, um, it's it's um, it's quite surprising, I would say, because um, uh, I mean, it's surprising for students because uh, uh, most of them um, are not used to having um, uh, classes on fishing, so they are quite unfamiliar with the with the context, even though they are quite familiar with the product. So this is something that's really uh, interesting, I, I find, um, because everyone um, has a relationship uh, to 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 fish, uh, but uh, is a little bit uh, kind of unfamiliar with uh, with the industry, uh, what it looks like, how it's changing very quickly as well. And, um, you know, we tend to say in France that when we ask young children to, to draw a fish, they will draw a square fish, like, uh, uh, because that's what they are used to, uh, to eating at school. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's actually quite similar when you're working with uh, business school students, they, they know what a fish looks like, but they're not really familiar with the industry, the working conditions, um, and also the evolution of the sector. So it's something that um, generates a lot of uh, a lot of interest. What I've also seen is at the end of my class, students have to submit a, a final essay. I was looking back before this webinar about the last cl uh, class I gave. Out of forty uh, four students, uh, three that decided to do their final essay specifically on labor conditions in the fishing industry. So it was actually the most uh, represented sector. All of the others went into many different directions, but uh, apparently it caught the attention of several of the students to want to dedicate their, their research on this. Um, I don't know if she can hear me, but I saw in the participants that uh, actually one of my uh, students was here. I didn't plan for her to come. And I don't know if she's still here. Maybe she's left, Christina. And apparently she's left. I, I would have asked her to give some feedback about her experience listening to the course, but uh, but I'll leave it here. Maybe what we can do is um, open the floor for uh, some of the questions uh, some of you might have um, and take yeah, the remaining 20 minutes to, to answer any type of questions you, you may have. So if anyone wants to ask anything, uh, please, uh, now's the time. Yeah, Alicia, I see you raise your hand. Uh, go ahead. Hi, um, thank you guys for this tool. This is um, really, really amazing. One thing um, I've been thinking about and more is just kind of a thought on um, something we could maybe talk about or work on for the future is I think this tool is really amazing for business human rights classes. And I know that like our goal is to move it to mainstream business. And like I'm teaching my first class right now and it's not an elective class it's like all it's executive MBAs in Mexico t learning business ethics sustainability and corporate governance. And i'm figuring out how to you know wade the waters to bring up these topics in a way that you know I won't get that they'll still listen to me right um, and actually my class last night was the first time we talked about CSR and I really wanted to bring up, you know, you know, critical views of CSR and bring up a, like worker driven social responsibility and felt really I like made my slide deck 40 million times like deleting it, how can I say it in a way that won't scare them away. Um, and I was so pleasantly surprised. Um, there was certainly some pushback, but it would like there was an amazing debate among students about the problems with CSR from their experiences. And I think that's really valuable. And so finding a way to either tailor these materials and have additional materials on language to use or how to bring these topics up in a way that 
you know, the business leaders, we really <laughs> need to learn these things rather than people who already want to learn it, um, are not so afraid of and like turned off by learning these issues, I think is such a, um, a would be, uh, such a great space for this group of people to be able to figure out how to um, design or tailor tools that work towards audiences outside of the business human rights community or people who are even interested to learn about it. Thank you for your comment. And I mean, I understand that it's, um, uh, I mean, it's not that directed specifically to the tool, but this type of feedback, that's something we would like to, uh, you know, like for example, if you do in your class, um, um, decide to use phishing and, and forced labor as a prompt for conversation. And, you know, if you want to share the feedback, to us, that's really what we want to put on the on the platform. Uh, one of the participants in the uh, workshop when we um, developed the resource teaches finance, and so for her, it was clear that if she was going to use this tool, it was going to be uh, for uh, students in finance. Mm -hmm. It didn't seem relevant for us in the standard tool to be too heavy on finance. Otherwise, a lot of people would not really understand why. But having on the on the teaching resource platform a feedback from a finance professor saying, well, this is how I taught and how I used phishing and forced labor and decent work challenges as a way to raise questions about asset management or things like this. Yeah. That's really what we what we would like to see happening, kind of a community of conversation around this tool um and um and yeah so i hope that in your in your class you can um yeah. you can discuss this uh mm -hmm. at some point and if you do that you can give feedback to us or that you can reach out to some of us saying okay now i feel comfortable using phishing in my class but how would you recommend me to do it? And, you know, with Doro and Barrett and Alex and others, we can brainstorm with you about some suggestions, maybe connect you to some ILO colleagues who are working in the region where you are and who can provide maybe more kind of practical information or, or, or come as guests or whatever. That's really the type of services we want to provide for, for teachers because we understand it's not just one PDF that is going to make you feel comfortable and, and be ready to talk about an industry that yourself maybe are not fully familiar with. So that's, that's what we want to do. Great. Yeah, I did. I have assigned Veja, the Veja teaching case my students, they're working on that today for a sustainability analysis. And, you know, we talked about Tony's Chocoloni and we talked like, it's so fun. I get to pick what my students learn about, um, but fishing. And because I've been working a little bit in the Chile, but not like the it's Chile salmon farming. So it's a little bit different, um, but, you know, similar issues. Um, but thank you guys so much. You're welcome. And I do want to remind everyone, I mean, fish today is one the most uh, food traded commodities in the world in terms of value so it's it, my students feel it's kind of odd why are we talking about fish in a business school but it's uh, in terms of value it's sometimes overlooked as a product and as some of the other speakers were saying it's it's cosmetics when you're talking about fish farming actually to to, to farm fish you actually need fish that has been captured at sea to, to produce fish meal. So all of these are embedded into one another. So it's, it is quite a big industry and, and it would be worth, you know, speaking about it more to students. Can I add- Do we have any, any other um, questions? Can I just add one sentence? So I think I could also imagine simply asking the students, so who would your sort of your dream employer? In my case, I'm in a landlocked country in Switzerland. They often say Nestlé or um, L'Oreal. Like a lot of my students also want to be in uh, cosmetics, indeed. And so here's your hook. You know, you can immediately say, well, you might be managing the pet food portfolio of Nestlé one day, and you won't realize as of yet that this is linked to today's topic um, because all the fish goes into pet food and. Nestle has actually been accused of forced labor and the Thai fishing and the fish goes into their pet food. So um, it, it really opens their eyes to understand that 
the fish topic cuts across a number of sectors that are attractive employers, even in a landlocked country, Switzerland, without a port or ocean. <laughs> I also have a very brief addition. It's uh, a tool about forced labor in the fishing industry. So most of it is contextualized in the fishing industry, but it's of course also about forced labor. So there are a couple of uh, slides and resources about forced labor that you could also just take out and then reapply to a different context. And then maybe the way it's contextualized in this fishing tool um, helps you thinking, for example, what kind of questions are are critical in the fishing sector. What makes workers in the fishing sector so vulnerable to forced labor? And then apply that in a context that's more relevant in the uh, country or in the context that you're in, that you have more expertise on. I, I think you said that you were based in Mexico currently. Correct, uh, because for example, uh, another hook is that uh, last year Mexico adopted for the first time a regulation on banning the imports of any product that is made out of forced labor. Uh, they adopted this new regulation because it's part of their obligation under the, the, the trade agreement that they have with the United States and Canada. And um, in fact, we had a very interesting discussions uh, last uh, last year with them on how are they going to implement this new regulation? Because a lot of responsibilities to to check whether the companies in Mexico import any product made out of forced labor will be on the company itself. So, you know, um, that's a, a very important hook, and I think this will this can change also a lot of the conversations in the private sector. Just for you to know also, last year, for example, with the ILO, CONCAMIN, which is the Mexican Employers Association, uh, joined the ILO Global Business Network on Forced Labor because they want to do more on this and they want to, to be able to adequately engage in those discussions with the private sector and provide some of the tools. So maybe a, a possible person also or organization to invite for future discussions. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's interesting to think about, like I saw when they made that announcement and in my head, I'm like, how are they going to enforce, how will that be enforced? Um, like, I mean, so many standards. Um, but yeah, I would love to, you know, chat more, be connected with anyone who could be helpful. Thank you. Great, do we have any other questions from the room about the tool, how to use it? Um, I hope our presentation has been clear. I see Jorge with a thumbs up, thanks for that. Okay, well, I do hope, um, I mean, some of you will, uh, will try it out. Um, again, as I was saying, the there's a, a, an email address, a standard email address you can use to, to uh, take some time to come and speak in the classroom if some of you want to, uh, to to have me as well, or you know if you want to have more of a private conversation about um, how to go about it. Um, I'm really seeing a lot of interest from students. As Barrett was saying, sea piracy is um, definitely something all of my students have seen. <laughs> They've not always remembered the part of cease piracy, which is on uh, um, uh, human rights and uh, labor conditions. Uh, so it's also a very good um, topic uh, to look at the tensions between uh, sustainability in the environmental and biodiversity aspect of the world and sustainability in the social dimension of the world. So that's something really interesting. Um, and also just want to mention that uh, uh, it's really topical in a lot of industries right now. Uh, I gave the class on the 5th of October, just a couple of months ago. On the very same day, you have the six uh, biggest hospitality companies that announced the launch of what is called HARP, uh, this Hospitality Alliance on Responsible Procurement. So basically Hilton and IMG and Radisson and Accor are creating a a multi-stakeholder initiative related to sustainable procurement. And in their press release, uh, when they 
came out with this information, uh, one of the things that they highlighted is that they want to work together on responsible procurement of fish. And so I found that quite interesting. Uh, it, it happened the very day I was teaching this class. Uh, but to see that, you know, it's something that's on the agenda of some of the biggest companies in the world in some sectors. And a lot of us would have, you know, Hilton or Accor or uh, uh, Radisson hotels uh, nearby where we live. So and students might be interested in working in these type of companies. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left. Maybe I just um, want to share. I don't know if uh, if Maria is uh, listening in and, and wants to take the floor. Also to say that uh, this resource and this webinar is, is the first one that we've um, we've developed, but uh, it's meant to be uh, part of a series of teaching resources. The MOU doesn't end with the first resource being out. And actually, we've already developed a second resource that's currently in, in finalization. And that was with a colleague of Alix, Maria Galotti from the ILO as well. So Maria, do you want to say a word about this? Sure. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's been very interesting and also to see how many of you are, are interested in, in this tool. So, I mean, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. And indeed, as Charles uh, said, you know, we are uh, working uh, toward finalization of a, a similar uh, module or teaching material which uh, will be focusing on migration, on labor migration, and in particular on the process of recruitment of, uh, of migrant workers. Uh, because we know that uh, sometimes exploitation starts at the recruitment stage, and this has very uh, significant impact on business uh, uh, operations along supply chains. So we are uh, finalizing this uh, material. It will be soon available as well. I mean, I was also interested to see some of you working in different regions in Mexico. This is, a, for example, a country where we work a lot on migration and uh, recruitment of, of migrant workers. I think it would be great that we have also this material made available in different languages. Um, that's uh, something perhaps to think about in the future, you know, I know that you're teaching mostly in English, but, uh, you know, um, we go a little bit by the demand as well, you know, so I think it'd be interesting to hear, uh, you know, interest uh, into having materials translated in languages like, you know, Spanish or French, you know, so... Yeah, food for thoughts, but I think I, I will keep on, you know, uh, contributing to this process and hearing from you all because you are the one really that, you know, are delivering <laughs> and having students in front of you and, and it's a learning process for, for all of us. So thank you for the opportunity uh, of being with you. Maria, thank you. <laughs> if I can jump in here, I would like to echo what you said. These tools are for our community of instructors at business schools. I'm very keen to hear from all of you how, how are things going in the classroom as you use this material. As I said, I'm very keen to integrate um, your versions on our public um, platform because I think it's important to make sure these this material remains open source so that anyone around the world who teaches can have access and can use that. Um, Jorge in the chat already requested access to um, the migration tool. So we better get our act together to push that over the finish line <laughs> um, and have that done before the summer because I do think it's another really hot topic that cuts across all kinds of industries. And by making these resources available, I do believe this increases the chances for instructors to bring that to the classroom and prepare an entirely like a new generation of business leaders that better knows how to navigate these often awfully complex um, issues. But right now, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised how um, excited my students are about these topics. Um, I feel like they get it very quickly and they want to be taught the skills for how to manage um, human rights in business. Um, typically, they're worried that my class talks about all the bad business and yet they want to be successful in business and they want to be part of the solution. So helping them 
to do the right thing as they're um, becoming executives, I think is most important. So these, all the tools always end with directions towards solutions. How can business make a positive contribution? So that I think is most important um, for this next generation that wants to be part of the solution. So yes, thank you for your interest. Thanks to um, everyone who contributed today. Um, and um, this is the video version of the teaching notes <laughs> accompanying what you can find on the website, but don't hesitate to also reach out to us um, personally if you have more questions. Um, with that, I think I close today's sessions and wish you a good afternoon. Thank you very much again, bye.